<coughs> and I call uh, Chris Hopkins. Thank you very much, Mr Chair, and I um, um, thank you for giving me this opportunity to speak for the first time on the Health and Safety Reform Bill. Can I begin by acknowledging uh, all those who have lost loved ones in the workplace uh, through workplace-related uh, injury? Can I also acknowledge all of those who have had their lives uh, um, altered by injuries in the workplace and acknowledge that uh, there are many, many uh, injured people who are injured in the workplace every year. Uh, the impact of those injuries goes on for some time, often long after the physical manifestations of those injuries have uh, well healed. And I want to acknowledge all of those. I want to talk uh, first of all about the purpose of the bill and the principles behind it, and then I've got quite a few technical issues that I want to raise with the Minister to see if we can get some answers on those. So the first part of the bill that I want to talk about under the purpose clause one, is 1G, which is the, the, uh, basically the, the Act aims to provide a framework for continuous improvement and progressively higher standards in work, health and safety. And I've been visiting uh, a number of um, firms in my electorate asking them about this, and it would be fair to say it's certainly got business talking, this particular debate, uh, and it's got them considering the implications of this legislation for their workplaces. And I've actually been surprised um, by the level to which those firms are already engaging in the detail and are already preparing for this Act to be implemented. And some of the concerns that they have are not some of the ones that I might have necessarily anticipated. I visited, for example, uh, an engineering firm uh, who employ more than the 20 people mentioned, uh, and they are concerned that if the um, small business exemption goes through, that many of their competitors, those people who they are competing with for contracts, are not going to be subject to this Act, but they are. And so their um, concern, for example, was what happens if a firm simply separates themselves uh, into a number of different compete, you know, firms with, under, under one umbrella in order to get around this Act, and they could find themselves competing with, with that firm, uh, and therefore they, they're subject to a, a higher standard than, than some of the people that they are competing, that they are competing with. And, and so, they are, so they are concerned about that, uh, and I think that that's a legitimate concern. So I'm interested in hearing from the Minister how it will be uh, that that will be avoided, that that kind of behaviour from firms will be avoided, uh, because uh, it seems to me that if a firm is able to set up, say, a new firm, a subsidiary company, for each new contract that they get, and employ fewer than 20 company, if, if fewer than 20 employees within each of those subsidiary companies, and therefore able, is able to get around the provisions of the Act, uh, then I think that, you know, that, that actually really starts to question quite fundamentally uh, whether this, this is going to achieve uh, the goal that is set out quite clearly there in Clause G. The second point that I want to raise is around uh, 3.1D, uh, which is around the promoting the provision of advice, information, education and training in relation to workplace health and which safety. Course? Which course? Um, sorry, uh, 3, 1, uh, where was I? 3, 1, D, uh, around the pr uh, promotion of um, uh, advice, information and so on. And the feedback again that I've had from the businesses in the, uh, is in the electorate is that they want to comply with health and safety, they want to provide um, good, safe workplaces, uh, and in many cases they're going out of their way to do so. So one of the firms that I visited, for example, have just spent $25,000 getting people to come in and audit their work practices so that they can actually you know, get a good report on whether they're doing things well. And what they're concerned about is that they can't get straight answers as to whether or not what they're doing is going to be compliant and whether, in fact, they are you know, meeting the standard uh, to, for making best endeavours and all of those sorts of things to ensure that they're providing a safe uh, workplace. And so I, I guess the question for the Minister is what leadership government will play in that regard through WorkSafe, uh, ACC and others, and saying to employers, yes, you are actually doing you know, the right thing, or no, you need to shape up because those employers do want to comply with the Act, and at the moment they're not uh, sure that they're necessarily going to be able to, and I think uh, that certainly is um, something that they would like to uh, answer, have answers to. I want to turn then to the um, uh, Clause 6, which is around the application to the armed forces, and uh, there is an exemption here for those who are on um, operational service within the New Zealand military. And while I can certainly understand uh, that there would be 
you know, you're putting troops into harm's way, for example, in the military, and so to some extent there are going to be net, you know, health and safety risks in that, that's, in, that's inherent uh, in being involved in military service. However, there are other examples where, um, you know, which I would like to tease out more, where this might um, create some strange uh, behaviour. So, and the question that I have particularly is around, for example, a, a disaster domestically within New Zealand. So if you take, say, the Canterbury earthquake, where the military may be deployed on operational service as a result of a, a, a disaster here at home, um, would this exemption apply there? And what would the justification for that exemption be uh, in applying in that circumstance? Because it seems to me uh, that you, you'd have someone like the fire service, the police, other forces who are operational in those things who, are, who would have to comply with the Act. Uh, and then, Mr Chair? Uh, Chris Hopkins. Mr Chair, and you could end up with the military not having to comply with the Act. And I'd like to know a little bit more from the Minister about uh, how that might come into being and, and what might happen around that. Uh, clause 7, which is around the application to aircraft in operation. Uh, this one, I, I sort of have worked through it carefully and tried to get my head around what it actually means. And um, the, the examples that I'm interested in here are aircraft that start their operation in New Zealand, but they might have a continuous flight that stops off along the way. It might be a lot, you know, two long-haul flights, for example. So they start, say, in Auckland, they travel long-haul to somewhere. They often have a change of crew, uh, and then travel on to another destination. Now, my reading of that would be that if the crew is if, if the crew is still employed by the same employer, even if the crew is domestically resident somewhere else, um, would they be covered by this? Now, I, I would I would expect that yes, they would be by this. But, but it, it, I, I would be concerned that there might be ways of, the, of, of, a, of, an, air, of a, an air operator getting around that. Um, and so I'd just like some clarification from the Minister on that particular part of the Act, because it seems to me if you've got a, you know, a New Zealand airline, and we now have more of those uh, than we've, we've had previously, or more operating here domestically in New Zealand than we've had previously, which is a good thing, um, what we would want to avoid um, is them sort of getting halfway through a journey and then being able to opt out of the health and safety law because they're changing crews and potentially even changing um, the, the part of the airline that's operating the, the, the aircraft at that time. And so I'd like to get some further clarification from the Minister on that particular one. Uh, I then move to 10A, uh, which... Uh, sorry, 10... 11, sorry, clause 11, which basically states that this act does not apply to a prisoner who is carrying out work inside a prison. Uh, and I would like to hear the justification for that. Because, uh, again, we come back to that issue where if you've got a firm uh, that's based in a prison and using the prison workforce, which is something that I personally want, uh, believe, believe in, because I believe in prisoners being provided with employment opportunities and upskilling opportunities through work in prison. But the, the, whoever it is that's operating that work uh, may, or that, that work site may be competing to get business with, an, with a, a firm from outside who is not operating with a prison workforce. So why would you have the health and safety rules apply to the firm outside but not to the firm inside the wire, inside the prison. Why would you say to a prisoner who is doing exactly the same job as somebody working in, in the same role outside of prison that they have less of a right to health and safety than uh, somebody working outside the prison? So I'd be very interested to hear the justification for that Clause 11 uh, and why it is that the government think that prisoners should be exempt from this legislation when they are doing a job that is equivalent to someone doing exactly the same job outside of a prison, because I, I don't think that there is any justification for that, uh, and I would be very, very interested to hear from the government if there, in fact, there is, or whether uh, this is perhaps an un unintended part of this, um, this bill. So uh, those, are, those are my first questions, so I'm looking forward to, in due course, getting some replies from the Minister on those. I've got others which I'm sure we'll get to as the debate progresses.